Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's event hosted by the Center for Slavery and Justice. This event is part of the This America series, a series of conversations about racial slavery and its legacies and anti-Black racism. My name is Nicole Gonzalez Van Cleve, and I'm an associate professor at Brown University in the Department of Sociolo Sociology. I'm also an affiliated faculty at the American Bar Foundation in Chicago, Illinois. I am now a fellow at the Center for Slavery and Justice, and I'm leading uh, the research cluster on mass incarceration. And we are so honored to welcome Professor Lawrence Ralph, the author of the new book, The Torture Letters, Reckoning with Police Violence. The Torture Letters confronts a horrific truth the Chicago police tortured generations of black men as part of, part of their institutionalized patterns of practice. One that is part of a continuum of force that controls black communities. This book examines how police torture shapes the lives, legacies, and everyone linked to these horrific acts. Professor Lawrence Ralph is a professor of anthropology at Princeton University and previously a professor at Harvard University for nearly a decade. He earned his PhD and Master's of Arts degree in anthropology from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor of Science degree from Georgia Institute of Technology. His research explores how police abuse, mass incarceration, and the drug trade make disease, disability, and premature death seem natural for urban residents of color who are often seen as disposable. His first book, Renegade Dreams, by the from brought excuse me, uh, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2014, received the C. Wright Mills Award. His second book, The Torture Letters, explores a decade long scandal, decades long scandal, in which hundreds of black men were tortured in police custody. His writing has been featured in the Paris Review, the New York Times, the New York Times Review of Books, The Nation, and many other public facing um, publications. And today, I want to start by a documentary um, that Professor Ralph has worked on that it really is inspired from his book and is a, a very ambitious project. I'm going to share my screen now so you can see. Um, the, let's see here. It's on one second. Maybe our IT folks can um, handle it while we're while we're talking and getting started. Um, so Professor Ralph, thank you so much for joining us today and for writing this um, inspiring book. So I'll put the, do the traditional. Um, so can you talk a little bit, it sounds like you were a student at the University of Chicago. So I'm, I'm wondering, tell us a little bit about your time in Chicago and how it inspired the questions that you decided to tackle in the torture letters. Thanks a lot. Um, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be in this conversation. Uh, with, um, you know, tackling some of the most important issues. Um, yeah, so I started originally when I was in Chicago working on a project on gang violence that ultimately resulted in uh, Renegade Dreams, my first book publication. And then uh, while I was doing that research on, on violence, it, it began to become a study of injury and what I mean by that is that I focused a lot on young men who had been paralyzed as a result of gun violence. Mm. And injury became a way that I began to see uh, marginalized communities. And that is, they're both subject to violence, but also people are trying to repair themselves and repair their communities and heal. Uh, and while I was doing that research, I heard a lot about John Burge and um, this is before the Black Lives Matter movement, and mm -hmm. a lot of residents were saying that, well, if nothing ever happened to Burge, then nothing will happen to these officers who are gunning down people and, and shooting them in the streets. And so I, I began to research the history of police torture in Chicago and what people have been doing to try to heal from that history as well. So uh, the story of police torture in Chicago is a horrific story, uh, but it's also a story of people trying to first say, yes, this actually happened to me. And it's an uh, activist community rallying around them and trying to bring those injustices to light. 
And I, you know, and I want to acknowledge something that I think a lot of instructors um, struggle with. I struggle with, um, I've been, my research has been, uh, um, has investigated the Laquan McDonald shooting, the, the shooting by Jason Van Dyke. Um, you know, he was last to the scene and shot Laquan McDonald 16 times and there was a vast cover up. And I think there is a lot of white liberals that feel like if we only show the torture, if we only show the violence, then there will be outrage and sympathy and there will be some kind of change. And I think you, you address this very early on about this kind of balance that we don't necessarily want to, um, I don't want to say flaunt or, you know, expose too much of the torture. We can, we can in some ways have a pornography of violence, but yet you talk about how important it is to really acknowledge what has happened. So can you talk a little bit about how you thought about that within your research and how much to share within the book? And then even as you talk about it in presentations. Yeah, so uh, a lot of my work on, on torture and trauma in general is indebted to both Holocaust studies and African-American studies. And in both of those scholarships, there's a, a, a lot of uh, thinking through trauma and a lot of work on uh, the witness and what does it mean to bear witness to a trauma. And uh, especially when we're talking about horrific events and the, the quintessential events that those two literatures are talking about are the Holocaust on the one hand and slavery on the other. And there's this idea that emerges from that literature that you can't describe the horrors of the Holocaust and you can't describe slavery. And in fact, the impetus to do so creates its own kinds of violences, right? And there's something about the unspeakable that we have to wrestle with. And so I'm very careful and attentive to what, what is unspeakable about trauma and, and what kind of eludes our efforts, no matter what. Uh, but at the same time, describing torture was very crucial, crucial to these cases because they were legal cases as well. And when you, when you go into the context of the court you have to describe in meticulous detail what happened to you. You have to describe the marks on your body. You mm -hmm. have to describe where those marks came from, how they produced um, injury and how that made you feel. And that describing it in that way and in that detail is how torture survivors came visible to each other. Mm -hmm. That's how they said, yeah, that happened to me too. And um, that's the, really the heart and the story of uh, the torture uh, cases in Chicago and the police torture scandal. And so I wanted to, at the same time, not reproduce the spectacle of the violence, but stay true to the necessity to, to talk, speak about it in, in detail. Mm -hmm. And so that's a fine line that one has to balance as a researcher and as a writer and I was very attentive to that. And so I wanted to figure out a way to write mm -hmm. very intentionally. Mm -hmm. And that's how I came to the idea to write the book as a series of letters. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that when I was in community settings and torture survivors were talking about what happened to them, it never seemed voyeuristic. And I wondered like why that was. I thought a lot about why, you know, at the same time I was trying to write about what happened and I was recoiling. And the people who I was sharing this to, sharing my work to were recoiling as well. And so how is it that we're describing the same thing and yet mine seems voyeuristic, but the torture survivors doesn't. And I eventually I came to realize that a crucial point of it is the audience and the intention. And the whole thing about voyeurism is that there's a voyeur who it's not necessarily their business to know 
but they are, their gaze is upon the issue and they're seeking pleasure and hearing about the issue and learning about the issue. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to make clear when I was writing this book is that I'm writing to specific audiences for particular reasons. I'm going to make my purpose of writing to them very clear mm -hmm. each time I write to them. And I'm not gonna allow for the uh, distanced, um, you know, uh, di distance consumption of the work. I'm calling everyone who reads it to be invested in it in a particular way. And in and, and doing so, the, those are some of the strategies that I, I took to, to mitigate the, the um, problem of voyeurism. And I think there, there was something about, you know, for me, I think about in my own work, when people deny people basic dignity, you know, and I think sometimes at the heart of it, you know, people have said my tone in my books and my writing about Chicago and ab abuse is that there's a sense of indignation. And yet I feel like, well, people were denied a basic dignity. So how do you reinstate that dignity in the writing? And I feel like there was something very humanizing and empathetic about, you know, the writing of a letter. And so can you explain a little bit both the both like the literary technique, but also the methodological technique. Cause I think that was so impressive is that, you know, you really are breaking the mold of what an academic book is. I mean, this is not necessarily, it's an academic book in its terms of its research and rigor, but in terms of its presentation and style, I feel like you moved us forward a ton. And so can you explain the, the letter uh, for those who haven't read the book yet, the, both the methods and the inspiration of the methods, but also the inspiration of the, of the, the literary presentation of what you found. Yeah, definitely. And thank you for that. And I think it goes back to something you just said, I, you know, this, this indignation mm -hmm. when we're speaking about injustice and there's this sense about when we're talking about social science that we should be objective, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that, that means that we should be dispassionate and that we shouldn't uh, pick a side or something like that. And, um, you know, I, I came to realize in writing this book that if you can't pick a side when you're talking about torture, you know, <laughs> right. You know, when we're talking about something that we know is a historical injustice. Right. And right. that's a problem with social science that's not a problem with me as a researcher you know yes. so when we're talking about uh historic right. how do you expect me not to pick a side on that right right, right. exactly that's, exactly and, and yeah. that's part of the problem actually when we don't pick a side <laughs> there we uh not picking a side is a form of complicity right. in the sense of um we're giving the benefit of the doubt to like police officers who, who don't deserve it, you know, in, in, in that sense. Like John Burge, it's clear what he did and it's clear what he thinks and it's on the record. Right. So what does it mean for me to then say, well, he must have another reason. Right, that's because we know his intention. Yeah. Right, um, he, he's, he made his intentions clear and he keeps making, he kept making his, is clear until he died. And so I think part of it is this issue with objectivity. And But I can't claim to have just taken that stance purely out of my own ethical uh, self, you know. This was, uh, I don't think there's a way that I could have done the work and been in the communities that I was in and said, I'm not taking a stance, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like that was a condition of me being able to do the work. Uh, and so part of what I, I did is I asked people when I first talked to them, you know, who do you want this project to be for? Yeah. Who do you want, you know, what you're telling me? Who do you want it to reach ultimately? And the people who are t I was talking to, I talked to 
uh, teenagers in Chicago. I talked to people of all races and ages who just wanted to know more about the history of police torture. I talked to former police officers. Uh, none of them said that they wanted to reach academics with what, you know, I, I was asking. Are you insulting the ivory tower? <laughs> no, no, it's not even it. No, so, I, I think it's perfect though. I love that truth. Like no one's gonna say that, right? Well, look, so yeah. when I did my first book, people did say that though. So okay. I did my first book on gangs. So since gangs are such in, in, in the, the popular imagination, and since there are all these stereotypes, people did, and since there are, is a history of researchers writing on gangs in the particular communities that I was writing about, people knew the, the, the literature to a certain degree. They knew about cultural poverty. They knew about all of that. Right. And so when there was a sense like, no, don't write that, write like this. You know, when you tell the other people about us, tell them this, you know? But there wasn't that here. It was just, um, you know, tell the mayor, tell other police officers, tell the activists, you know, uh, you know, keep them going. And so I, I wanted to take that seriously. And, and so those became the focal points of the letters. And um, in terms of methodology, um, I wanted to create an exchange in, with, in which it's not just, uh, you know, I think part of the lie of social science, social science as well is that we, we presume that we just do this research project and then that's it. But when you do research a lot of times, this is like an ongoing conversation that lasts well beyond the book, well beyond a particular project. And it's an exchange, it's an ongoing dialogue uh, and you're creating relationships. And so I wanted to be uh, explicit about the relationships I was creating as I was creating them. I wanted to be explicit about the layers of conversation. I wanted to be explicit about what I was learning from them and how I changed my thinking at a given point in time and what other people were saying about uh, perhaps a politician that they wanted me to address. And so I wanted to kind of build that into the way that I was writing. And I think that's part of the methodological intervention. It's just being clear about, um, you know, the purpose of the scholarship and how the scholarship bends and, 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 and shifts at, at different moments in time. Mm -hmm. and uh, how it's unfinished, it's, it's an unfinished product. And um, that's, that's what I wanted to do through the letters. Well, it was beautiful. And I, so I, um, we have a heroic media services person. Hannah has the, um, the documentary that you've adapted from the book queued up and I hope it'll work. So Hannah, if you can take it away, I'd love to hear one of these letters. Letter three. An open letter to the late Dominique Damo Franklin. I didn't know you while you were living, but I do know you in death. You died at 23 and were much loved by your friends and family. But as a teenager and as a young adult, you experienced run-ins with the Chicago police that instilled in you a healthy fear of the cops, a fear familiar to many African-American youth. I also know that on May 7th, 2014, you allegedly stole a bottle of liquor from a convenience store. And when the police showed up, you ran. The officers chased and then caught you. Once they handcuffed you, they used a taser on you two different times. The second time, you fell and hit your head, lapsing into a coma from which you never awoke. When I think about the circumstances of your death, I can't help but remember the first man to expose police torture in Chicago, Andrew Wilson. His life and your death lead us to question, what kinds of police violence are we willing to accept? The police electrocuted Andrew with a mysterious device 
called the Black Box. A police commander, John Burge, supposedly engineered that box for the sole purpose of inflicting pain. The city of Chicago has now apologized to more than 100 black men who were tortured in this way. What Burge did to them and to Andrew Wilson is now considered unacceptable, unlike what the Chicago police did to you. The police electrocuted you with the weapon we've all become familiar with. The Taser Company engineered the device for the purpose of incapacitating people who were deemed dangerous. The police tased you just past midnight because of your alleged actions, but the city of Chicago has never apologized to you. When it comes to you, our government believes that the police acted within the scope of the law, and therefore, what those officers did to you, how they killed you, has been deemed reasonable. I want to tell you that a growing number of Americans disagree. From the taser to the black box, police violence exists on a continuum, and the violence on that continuum has one thing in common. It represents the ways our country injures and kills its most vulnerable groups. And we must change our country's tendency to systematically kill and deliberately control people in honor of you, Demo. Oh, that is so powerful. <laughs> Thank you for uh, creating that and the words and all of it. Um, I, you know, I don't even know where to begin. There's so many questions from that, but I think that gives, for those folks who have not read the book, I think that gives a sense of the beautiful writing, but also the format of the letter. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you thought about translating this book to this kind of mini documentary? Because I think there is this, I, I've been saying this in, for, in the field of sociology, there are still colleagues that debate whether you should go public with your data. And as someone who, you know, as someone from Chicago, as who had family in Little Village, who's had a cousin that's been incarcerated in the same system that I've studied, to me, that seems like such a naive question. It, it just shows how removed you are from the people that you study and this kind of debate, this objectivity, like what are we being objective about? We, sometimes we do need to kind of pick a side and to not be public about such important data is a form of complicity I call it sociological malpractice, if there could be such a thing. So tell me about how you did this. Like, was this always a goal of yours, which was to translate it into multiple forms of communication and art? Yeah, definitely. It was always a goal. Um, but part of that came from the research itself. Uh, you know, part of the, the police torture reparations ordinance, which happened in 2015, uh, and this ordinance was landmark because uh, it awarded communal concessions. And, and that's important in the context of police violence because the norm now, especially in Chicago, is settlements. You know, the mm -hmm. Chicago Police Department has a budget item for millions of dollars yeah. settlements every year. It's $153 million per year on misconduct right. and that to me when people hear that i'm like please process this so you understand because these cases i mean imagine what we could do to schools and communities affected by violence right it's like right. that line item is like a predictable patterned way they know this violence is going to happen over and over again right so right. i just for those who are new to the chicago case study i think that's an important figure 153 million dollars it's right. mind-blowing yeah, sorry, continue. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. So what comes with that oftentimes is also conditions that, you know, mm -hmm. you can't talk about it if you get a settlement. And that just feeds into the silence of what actually happens. And what is important about this ordinance in 2015 is that it did award um, some settlement money uh, to the torture survivors but it also awarded communal things. So such as the creation of the Torture Justice Center where anyone who has been a victim of police violence can go and get free counseling. Um, the creation of 
uh, job training programs, uh, higher educational opportunities for torture survivors and their families. Um, but importantly, it created a mandate that the history of the Chicago uh, scandal, these cases, would be taught in eighth grade and, and 10th grade. And so, you know, as an educator, that appealed to me in particular, and I wanted to, you know, make sure that part of what I was addressing in this project was that component mm -hmm. or could be used for that component. And so, um, you know, as accessible as you want to be as an academic, you know, you're not that accessible where <laughs> you, know, you could say reliably that and confidently that, you know, an eighth grader could read this, you know, a 10th grader could read this. And so I knew I wanted to create something visual and something that kind of broke it, broke down the heart and the emotions of what I was trying to convey in the research. And that was the idea uh, to do to do some kind of animation to go on, to go along with the film. Yeah. To go along with the book. It's beautiful. Um, I think what, one of the, to me, the key takeaway, and this is maybe my bias as a scholar of mass incarceration and punishment was in this sample letter uh, that's you know from the book, you make the link between a torture device that Burge used that we absolutely know is wrong, or we have a decent amount of collective, you know, agreement that that such a device used in that particular way reads like a war crime, if you will. I mean, it's clearly torture, but then you're linking it to something that many people think is just okay, which is this taser that ultimately kills somebody as well, right? That has deadly outcomes. And I think, you know, to me, um, even if someone's tased in that moment, it's still a scar. Like even if you live, right? We talk about someone who dies, but when you live, I think there's still a scar of emotional, psychological. So can you talk a little bit about this continuum that you create uh, uh, within the book, this kind of theoretical way of thinking about torture and its links to modern day policing, just the, the everyday practices that we have right now. Yeah, so I think that, you know, there's a way in which when you talk about torture, it can see, seem so big mm -hmm. and it can, it can be exceptionalized. And, and so I can say like, okay, this book is about a police torture scandal in Chicago that exceptionalizes Chicago, which is always already exceptionalized, and then ex exceptionalizes the act of violence as if it's like mm -hmm. the, the more egregious than everyday violence. In a sense, of course, it is more egregious, but you know, just like when somebody dies, you know, like Quan McDonald is more egregious in that sense, but it is also very um, expected and it, it's linked to routine ways that in which people experience police presence. And so when I was talking to various communities and, and, and young people about police torture, they didn't dwell on the exceptionality of the torture itself. Mm -hmm. What they talked about was the routine ways that they're policed in their communities mm -hmm. and how in the blink of an eye they know that something like this could happen. And so for them, they believed the torture survivors right away. There wasn't a question that this happened to them or, it, or um, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't an issue where at, in the court of law, when these cases were tried, mm -hmm. when these cases are tried, that is always an issue of whether or not this person is making it up or telling the truth. So, um, it's remarkable in that sense that for Chicagoans, especially black Chicagoans, it's not a question that this happened. And the way that they know it can happen is the, is because of this continuum of force in which the way police officers look at them, what they say to them, right. how they stop and frisk them, you know, how they sometimes beat them up, you know, how they sometimes, uh, you know, do, extra things when when they're you know taking them in to the precinct mm -hmm. all these things uh you know make it so that 
something like torture can become uh, it seem like it could happen in in the every in the, in the everyday. And so I wanted to capture that by discussing this continuum of force and also discussing the other things that we might not think about, like tasering someone right. that is actually very horrific. You know, mm -hmm. after reading this book, I hope everyone sees that, you know, taser electrocuting someone is right. actually a horrific kind of thing. And right. when I was writing this book, I saw tasers everywhere. I saw them you know, in sitcoms and as comic relief and all sorts of things. And, and we've normalized certain um, certain forms of police misconduct that are very troubling that it also allow torture to happen. Absolutely. Um, in preparation for this discussion, I went on um, the Invisible Institute for, you know, scholars and students out there that are listening. They did an, uh, a wonderful thing, which was to um, go after the Chicago police for their police allegations. So all the people that complain and provide allegations of abuse. And they have some really astounding statistics. Um, from 1988 to 2020, they've had, there's been 247,000 allegations of misconduct and only 7% of officers have been disciplined. There's been uh, 57,000 cases of use of force, plus or minus, and only 3% have been disciplined. And I think what's troubling is that the Chicago police just elected um, a man named John uh, Ket, let me make sure I say it right, Katenzara. He's had 50 allegations of um, against him. He has five use of force complaints and he's now the union leader and he has more offenses than 96% of other officers. And I think his base salary is about $93,000. The city pays him yearly. To me, that's astounding in scale, right? And I think, you know, when we think of police misconduct, the fact that the, you know, the, the, that 7% are, dis, are, you know, disciplined, I mean, that's nothing. And all those complaints, the legacies of that, you know, I mean, what are we to make of, the fact that Chicago police, I mean, we, the, I've tried to really hit home that this bad apple narrative is kind of, is absolute rubbish. Like it's just terrible because it makes it sound like it's a few isolated people, but we know it's much bigger than that. The web is bigger. And, but they've also, Chicago police have also elected somebody that is one of the worst among them, particularly 90, he has more complaints than 96% of other officers. So what it leads me to think is that there's a type of policing that you detail in this book that is based on torture. It may be a continuum, but that the Chicago police at every turn double down on that brand of policing for black and Latino communities. What can we do to repair that? Is that repairable at this point? Uh, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think it, it points to the structure of, um, policing, but also the structure of complaints and the, the criminal justice system. I mean, something that you detail so well in your book. Uh, this is why, you know, I try to kind of in the book articulate this idea of the torture tree. Mm -hmm. and, and that is these precisely these kinds of relationships that you're just articulating. So it's not just that someone is tortured in police custody, it is the fact that someone who is tortured in police to custody told, you know, the district attorney, and then the district attorney didn't say anything, and then that district attorney then later becomes a judge, and when that person's a judge, they don't say anything about these cases, and or the judge later becomes a politician, and when they're a politician, they try to quell down. Uh, protests or, or complaints about these things. So it is actually the structure of the, the relationship between uh, violence and systems of accountability. Mm -hmm. And the police union is a part of that. And the, the fact that this person who has a history of misconduct can then become a union uh, chief 
-hmm. and we know how powerful unions are is not coincidental it's not accidental it's it's purposeful and it's part of how the system uh, protects itself it's it's part of how torturers are allowed to hide in plain sight it's mm -hmm. part of how uh, you can have a scandal go on for decades and decades and decades and uh, nothing happens uh, these are all very intentional things. And so we I feel as scholars, we have to very be, we have to actually do the work of tracing those connections and, and, and documenting them and putting them out and saying like, look, these are, these are the connections and this is how it exists. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the wonderful thing that you discuss is that this is really you know, a connected web, right? So the, you use the tree metaphor. And I think, you know, for me, the frustration was that people saw, you know, scholars have rigidly been like, this is policing, I'm a policing scholar, and this is a court, and I'm a court scholar, and this corrections, are, I'm like, but well, where are they all intermingling, right? And then I think like Robert Vargas's book brings in the politicians and the gerrymandering and how violence can perpetuate itself as well. I mean, to me, they're there, we, we create as researchers these false distinctions, but when you're on the ground, you see that they're tightly linked, right? Yeah. I mean, the only thing I don't know what to do <laughs> with is the fact, you know, and I think about this all the time that the prosecutors, I mean, if this went on for 30 years and prosecutors continued to take these cases knowing that, that the suspects were tortured, that is a level of complicity without any accountability as well. Like we might hold a, you know, a chief prosecutor, but what do we do with the rank and file people that just, as I say, prosecutor with blinders on, or then the judge that knows a police officer is perjuring themselves, but continues to take a testimony. How do we create healing and reconciliation with those uh, participants as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I think part of it is looking at the incentive structures within these individual occupations themselves. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, a part of the book I always get asked about is the part where I talk about Black police officers mm. who are working under Burgess command at the time. And um, it was a similar kind of thing as the prosecutors that you're talking about. They actually developed elaborate strategies to keep themselves ignorant of mm -hmm. torture. It's like they knew about it, they heard the rumors, but they wanted to protect their livelihood. They wanted to rise in rank. They wanted to retire with their pensions. And so they, what I call in the book is learn to know what not to know. They learned how to do their job while remaining ignorant. And I think that is applicable to a lot of different occupations within the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And why do people do that? People do that because there's an incentive for remaining silent and there's disincentives for speaking out. They see what happens to the people who do speak out. So it's not that people never do it. It's just that the people who do it don't stick around. They're either fired or demoted or shunned in a way that others learn from that behavior. And the, the other people, those who stick around, are the ones that keep their mouths shut and stay in line and don't row the boat. And so we have to demand as a society different forms of accountability when it's set, when it comes to um, you know just the incentives for 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 what one deems as being successful in your occupation and maybe that looks like a, a, a whole different system right maybe it can't exist as it does now you know yeah. but yeah, if we really, if we're, if we're serious about um, addressing these issues, then we have to look at that as well. Yeah, and I, you know, I think one of the issues that I state over and over again, so, you know, after the 
shooting death of Laquan McDonald, the vast cover up. Um, Anita Alvarez continued to double down on not charging Jason Van Dyke for hundreds of days. And she was ultimately replaced by a uh, progressive prosecutor, Kim Fox. And one of the things that I've made a lot of noise about is she inherited all the people <laughs> that had been there in, you know, during Anita Alvarez, Alvarez's reign, during uh, Dick Devine's reign, keep going all the way back. And the, that culture was inherited. And I think, you know, I think some of the condemnation of a culture is what is so important because I think, you know, Eddie Johnson, you know, has numerous times sat in front of crowds saying, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not stupid. I know there's a racism problem and there can be a problem of racism, but I never saw it. And I'm thinking, really? But how did you get promoted? Right. How did you like that's I mean, to me, we know as social scientists, that's not how culture works. Right. You must have played within that incentive structure to yeah. to do that. Right. I mean, especially Johnson. I mean, what is your now that you look back on this? I mean, he was seen as kind of a a, a response to the previous chief. People saw him as a reformer. So lots of news media about he might have a history of violence or domestic violence, but possibly there was allegations that came out. What's your take now on his reign and his legacy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's unfortunate. I think it's it's one of those cases where where it just it, the idea of the bad apple. You know, there's a juxtaposition mm -hmm. between the bad apple and then there's the, the token, you know, mm -hmm. of the person who can come in and, you know, fix everything. And both are mythologies, you know what I mean? Like, just like there's no single bad apple, there's no genius that can fix a corrupt system right. by him or herself. And I think uh, Eddie Johnson, uh, in a way, he he's tokenized because He's seen as somebody who is like, oh, I'm from the hood. I'm from Chicago. I I know these communities, and I I'm a police officer, and I've you know risen through the ranks. So he's he's propped up to be the answer, but the answer is systemic. It's not, no no one person can be the answer, you know. And it feels like a type of gaslighting because Anita Alvarez was like that too. She would be saying, you know, she'd be in the parade and say, you know. Uh, trying to get votes from Little Village and, you know, uh, communities that were targeted by the Chicago police and continued to perpetuate that myth, that legitimizing uh, function that, you know, oh, no, I'm one of you and it's okay. And because I'm here, it's all better now. And I think that that to me is a type of gaslighting. It leads me to my question, which is, talk to me a little bit about the psychological level of torture. And by that, I mean, in my own research, um, I did a, a, a second book about being released from jail and they would in some ways threaten. So to terrify people, the sheriffs would pick people up from the precinct, drive them to the jail. And they basically would say, you know, when you get there, you're going to be sexually assaulted. And usually they would use uh, a black man as the, the, the perpetrator. They would actually use that. So it was a mixture of racism and violence and kind of psychological torture. And then in, you know, just the open court, I would see sheriffs, you know, wrapping a co extension cord around a, uh, a black defendant's chair, pretending to plug him into the wall. Um, you know, to me, that is a level of psychological torture. But then there is this gaslighting, which is, no, it's not happening. Let's conceal it so that everything you're experiencing, people don't feel as real. So, well, how do we think about that part? Because we focus so much on the physical, which is important and, and it's truly atrocious, but the, there is something psychological about this perversion of what the system is and what they're, they're able to do and say to people. And then, and then also then publicly say, oh no, that's not happening, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the book, I try to address it through uh, what I call the object and concept of the black box. Mm -hmm. So the black box is an actual torture device that John Burge um, is said to have used on uh, criminal suspects. And so the interesting thing about the black box is that, and this is a box, it's a, 
not to be too graphic, but it's a electrical device. You crank it by by hand. It 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 attaches to a person's body with leads and electrocutes them. And this is what John Birch uh, did to criminal suspects. But he destroyed the box before it could ever be presented in court. So the lawyers uh, from the People's Law Office, uh, Flint Taylor and the, the others who, who tried the cases for most of the torture survivors, mm -hmm. they recreated this box out of memory from police officers who had seen it, but also from torture survivors as they described what happened to them. And, uh, and so it is actually, on the one hand, a torture device that we know existed from the marks it left on people's body and from these other evidence that we have. But to your point, basically, Burge in the city of Chicago said it didn't exist. Imagine being tortured and then and being, having the marks, having the marks on your body, right. and being told that no, what are you talking about? You made that up. There's no torture device. It doesn't exist. Right. Like that is, you know, right. that's the level of psychological trauma. Right. And at the time that these cases were being tried. At first, they didn't even believe that you know PTSD existed, like in the '80s and stuff. Like they, like they were like, "What's that?" So there's not even the language that we have now to really uh, describe something that seems you know almost commonsensical to us. But I think the black box in general, I refer to it as an idea, as a concept as well. It's the idea that you know knowledge can just disappear into a black hole and and you know you can you know you might know as a police officer tortures to ex torture exists but you won't speak of it or as a da you know it exists but you won't speak of it it's how knowledge disappears itself and the ways in which we allow knowledge to disappear down a black hole because we don't want to deal with it uh as a society and so um yeah, for me, it's both. It's both the, the object, but it's also right. this, this concept of open secrecy. Right. And, and, and it's, it's funny that the dirty open secret is something I write about, but it's funny, they, uh, the, the attorneys used it for police perjury, which to me is the cover up part, right? If you could then, so you committed this torture and then you are, your police officer brought into the court so then you, what do you do? You lie about it. You conceal it by lying and getting your story correct with, you know, and so it's funny, that was a dirty open secret. So it's interesting that that is a common thread. It's not, you know, that that has been used. Oh, there's a lot of dirty open secrets in the yeah. entire criminal justice system in Chicago, right? Yeah. Uh, conditions within the jail, another dirty open secret that everybody knows that Tom Dart says he's a reformer, but the conditions are still terrible. I mean, so I think, you know, the secrecy, I love the idea of this black box, which is this like truth goes into the void. And I think what troubles me okay. is that, um, you can... oh wait, someone's microphone's on, sorry. What troubles me is that we don't tend to believe the victims. And I, I struggle with this in my own research. Because of that, I study up the chain of like the power chain. So I study the white power brokers, the police officers, the prosecutors, those most that have the most power and why they do the things that they do. But I think the other side of it is we just have not believed victims, right? Uh, if they have the scars in their body, we should believe them, right? If they say it's happening, we should believe them. We, why do we need a Department of Justice uh, uh, investigation yet again, telling us all the abuse that we know? I, how do we get to a point where black communities are listened to and heard. I mean, because to me, that's, that is the biggest obstacle. The black box works because we don't believe black people. And, and we as a society have not listened to what's happening for 30 years, more than that. I mean, keep going, keep going back in time. Yeah. And so, I mean, just to put a point on that, I think the, the people will often get confused when you talk about open secrets, because seems to be like a, a you know counterintuitive or oxymoron but 
it's not that people don't know about it. It's just that people feel like nothing, even if you do know, it doesn't matter because nothing is going to be done. Yeah. So it has precisely to do with power. And I think that, um, I think this goes back to how we started our conversation. I think what we could do about it as scholars is just to believe people and write from their truth and not qualify it mm -hmm. or anything. Because it's actually better scholarship because it is true you know like it has the it has the benefit of being closer to reality than the denials so um and it is even if we're if even if one was to investigate it from the perspective of giving the community the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. everything lines up in a way that's more accurate than if we investigate it from the perspective of giving the police the benefit of the doubt right like that is what is skewing reality and what is making us have to do contortions in order to uh get a clear picture mm -hmm. and so i think you know that's what we can do i think that we can shift the narrative and um and write from that truth i think it's hard in, in a greater society, we're wrestling against fact, you know, we're wrestling against, uh, you know, misinformation right. purposefully. So it's difficult, but I think, um, you know, again, this goes back to like the stances we have to take as scholars mm -hmm. uh, when, we're, when we're writing about thinking through researching historical injustices. Mm -hmm. So we're already getting questions in. So I want to encourage everybody. That's the 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 hard part about some of these webinars is that we can't. It's hard hard to interact sometimes with those watching. So if you have a question, and we haven't addressed it yet, so please uh, type it into the Q and A section, and we'll start to read some of them off. But the first question from an anonymous person. I wish you would have revealed yourself. Uh, but they love they love this um, the book, and they want to know if there are plans to make a feature film. Um, but they also ask, do you think the film has the potential to do more good in highlighting the issue or could a Hollywood treatment do more harm? Which was kind of the first question about this kind of this pornography of gazing and being voyeuristic about black trauma and, vi you know, and violence happening to black people. Is it better to do a Hollywood treatment? And do you have any plans? Uh, I <laughs> don't necessarily have plans. I think it should be done because just people don't, you know, outside of Chicago, you know, a lot of people don't really know about this history in it. And there's there's also many, you know, silenced scandals uh, in other parts of the world, uh, other cities in the U.S. that I think it's important to like look at the architecture of an open secret and say like, this is actually how it happens. This is how it's, um, you know, this is how it's um, kept under wraps for so long. Um, so I hope it's done. I think it can be done right. I mean, I think it's all about, um, you know, being being sensitive and being accurate, being true to the historical record, mm -hmm. being authentic to communities. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that Another reason uh, that I hope it's done is because there's just some things that you can't convey through words, you know? Yeah. There's some things that that exceed uh, that form of explanation that, that, that need a different medium to convey. And so, you know, film is powerful for that. Yeah. Um, so for me, I wanted to talk a little bit about the movement for reparations in Chicago. And you said that one important component was education. You know, it's funny because everybody sees the reparations movement as this huge victory. But when you think of the settlement dollars split amongst 130 people, and we know there are more people that probably should have been in that settlement, but who will never get a day in court and who'll never get to see any type of uh, settlement money 
And we think of the lives lost within prison, meaning they serve time and you just can't give people their time back, right? 20 years, 30 years. Yeah. You know, I know it's a victory because it's not been done, but I, I'm, I'm just curious, do you critically think it's a victory? Did it feel sufficient to the survivors and it doesn't feel sufficient to you? Um, I think it, you know, just just some background so over time you know the 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 settlements were very uneven because you can imagine if you got a settlement in the 90s or something you might have got like ten thousand dollars uh i think like there are like uh, i won't name names but some people early on torture survivors they got not a lot but if you got a settlement today because it's still happening, um, you might get part of the line item, right? right <laughs> you might right. get like, you know, $10 million or something like that. And so 10,000 versus 10 million, obviously that's a lot of money and it doesn't, it's not like you suffered something more than the person right. that got the settlement in the nineties. It's just more evidence out now. So you might be able to connect it now right. and therefore, gain a larger settlement so part of the settlement money was trying to balance that out right um that that the some of the things that had happened over time but in that way you can already tell there's it's insufficient you know um and yes the community resources are landmark and i think when we think about repaired and, and reparative justice I think it's very important to think collectively, like not just how something impacts the individual, but impacts families and impacts communities. And a lot of what is has gone on to the reparations ordinance is a product of community activism that really thought intentionally about um, how to heal communities and like, you know, just some heroic work by like the Chicago Justice Memorial and other and other groups that really try to think about trauma and its yeah. long term effects and how you heal. And, you know, that's that's you know, to be commended and to be replicated. Yeah. But the thing that the settlement didn't do was and this is not a fault of the activists, it's the fault of the city. It didn't ask anything of the police. Right. So it gave all this money to, to, to communities and said, basically, here are the resources you asked for to heal yourselves. But right. it didn't ask anything as a police. Or, or so, and that way, in that way, it's wholly insufficient, you know? It, it doesn't change the structure. So the question of what is to, to, to cause this to not happen again is not addressed. And that's, that's the key. And I, and I think the other, the, you know, the, the piece of, I think that's a perfect expression of that is the police, not only do they ha not have to do anything, meaning like you could imagine just a public apology by the new chief of police and say, we, the city of Chicago and Chicago police apologize, right? Just, you know, stage one, we will do X, Y, and Z to stop this from happening in the future. We've done, you know, we've, I mean, you know, even some of, you know, some people can even criticize those reforms as being symbolic in nature, but sometimes symbolism matters, but they really have done nothing. If anything, they've resisted reform at every step and they have no financial burden placed upon them at all, right? So the city keeps paying. This goes back to my original 153 million plus or minus per year that the city predicts and then pays out for this police misconduct, meaning the city is paying for this brand of policing. Um, and that to me is why, you know, the fight for reparations has never been satisfactory is that the police, to your point, absolutely have done nothing. And it's, I don't know, I'm not sure where we go from there, but I don't, do you think any financial incentives would force the police? So if the unions had to foot the $153 million bill <laughs> to a certain extent, do you think there would be some of the supposed good cops coming forward and saying, not from my pension? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I think that's 
you know, I think that would be an important step, like financial disincentives for misconduct. You have disincentives for a whole lot of things. And um, yeah, I mean, other people like uh, Rashawn uh, Ray have put forth proposals about this. And um, I think there it, it is important to think through those things that would materially restructure uh, how policing operates. Mm -hmm. So m moving on to the education, oh, somebody, uh, somebody named Danny Ritchie uh, has another question on that. If the city pays, that is taxpayer money, or it says that is the taxpayer, yes, unions, not taxpayers. And I think that's important is that uh, if you are a resident of the city of Chicago, that budget, that city budget is from the, the people, right? So that, you know, I lived in Chicago for 30 some years before moving here. I think that's troubling is that, I mean, how do we think about that? If, we're, if, the, if people from Chicago are listening to this right now, what control do we have to change that, to hold the mayor and the city council accountable that our taxpayers are paying for this police violence? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a point I try to make because it's important for people to know that it's them, it's their, it's their money. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it goes to the question of complicity, and and basically, it's bad enough that the city is speculating on like how much Black life is worth. Another way of thinking about this is like how much is it worth. So out of the 153 million, basically they know a certain amount of people are gonna be injured and killed by the police. Those people are gonna be majority black and brown. Mm -hmm. So if we divide that, they're saying, okay, this is how much it's worth, black life is worth precisely. If you die, it's worth a million dollars this year, mm -hmm. $2 million this year. And so, they're speculating, it's bad enough that they're speculating on the cost of life, but they're speculating it from taxpayer money, like your money. Right. Like, do you agree that it's worth that much? You know? Right, right. So it's like, if we knew, you know, as a collective that, you know, a bridge was killing like a hundred people a month and like, right. we could calculate how much people right. who drive on the bridge just died. And, you know, we might say that we want, we demand that the city fix the bridge, or if the person who was in charge of the bridge is not gonna fix it, then we want a new person in charge and we will get a new person mm -hmm. until the bridge doesn't kill anybody, you know? Or perhaps we won't, we'll agree that no one should drive on the bridge. Or, you know, so there's other ways in which we can navigate society if we know uh, what the problems are and we know how we're complicit in reproducing the problem. I don't think people are always knowledgeable of those things. Right. And I think the hard part too is the city itself is so segregated. This is a brand of policing, just to be very clear, <laughs> that this is how Black communities and to a lesser extent Latino communities are policed. Right, this is not happening in Lincoln Park. <laughs> this is not happening in Wrigleyville, right? And so I think, you know, the, to the bridge analogy, this really is a bridge that only black people are having to cross. And what we have not seen is that collective resistance to say enough is enough. Now, my hope is after seeing George Floyd die the way he did, it does seem that we're in a new era to a certain extent, but I wonder, people keep asking me, are we in a new era? <laughs> and I kept saying, I don't know, because we've shown people, activists, scholars, we've been showing you these terrible incidents of police violence and torture, and yet no one has gotten to the streets. But then we had this terrible death that did, but yet it was very similar to Eric Gardner, and it was very similar to Tamir Rice and Philando Castile, and we can name, continue to name. So are we in a new era where people are willing to say, it does not affect me, but I will fight to make it not so. Yeah, that's a, that's the key. I mean, I thought I was actually hopeful in the summer. I, I'm a bit less hopeful now, 
just because of like 70 million people, you know, in the election chose to uphold uh, white supremacy. But in the summer, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously we have to do the research on this, but I feel like the COVID moment and the George Floyd moment, the intersection of those things, you know, I think people were really wrestling with vulnerability. And I think part of the reason why a lot of people who are not affected by, like to continue the metaphor, the bridge that's not on their part of town, you know, they're not, they're not concerned with that because they don't see it as their issue. And they, they feel like at least the government will, you know, provide for the bridges on my part of town. So mm. I'm good. But I think the COVID moment showed that, nah, the government won't even provide for your bridges either. You know, it's like your bridges are connected to all those other bridges. It's like your vulnerability, the COVID, your inability to get tests now is part of a, like a wider structure of uh, vulnerability and neglect that people of color have just borne the brunt of. Yeah. So you're implicated in this too. And, it, and you, when you see someone dying at the hands of the state, that, that could be you. It's not like divorced from your reality. Right. And I think at a moment when people were wrestling with their own vulnerability, it was easier for them to see that. And I, I, and I hope that carries forward mm -hmm. in the sense that people realize, yeah, we are connected and the biggest problems of our day mm -hmm. are connected to each other, like climate change and, and gun violence mm -hmm. and you know immigration, all these huge issues we're not going to tackle in isolation. We have to actually think through them together and think about the most vulnerable and marginalized communities, their experiences with that first. We need to learn from that. Yeah. And, you know, I hope, I hope that's what is happening. And I, you know, I have to be hopeful about that, you know, and I think there are kind of different, there's a generational shift in which a new generation is not necessarily buying the old, mm -hmm. you know, the old racist dog whistling. And so I think there is reason to be optimistic that we can look at some of these problems in a new light. Yeah. So, so um, we have another question from Alana Rose. Um, they ask, are there any models of, uh, of reparations or retribution happening or have happened globally that we can look to as inspiration. Um, do you, is there any models that, or, or is Chicago seen as like the gold standard? In the US now, I think Chicago is seen as the gold standard. I mean, there's some models when we think about like uh, just repairing, how to repair from historical injustice and like truth and reconciliation in like South Africa and, um, and Germany has done work around the Holocaust and trauma and remembrance. And so there's global examples and countries have grappled with really, you know, huge stains on their, um, their national record in a way that the US hasn't, uh, you know, when it comes to slavery or something, for instance. Um, but in terms of like material resources now for injustices that are happening now, uh, the reparation ordinance is really, really special in that regard. So, um, yeah, I mean, I hope we build off of the, the strength of that. And so one of the things that I um, heard, well, part of the reparations was also education. So you mentioned the Chicago public schools. And I remember there being distinct pushback from white communities that tended to have lots of uh, police 
uh, department parents saying, no, they don't want their children to learn about this history. What was their claim in that? And, I, you know, to me that felt, uh, it was giving us an insight into a world of policing families and the work that policing families have to do to in some ways rationalize what their loved ones do on a daily basis. So can you give us a little bit of insight onto that, their narrative as well? Um, I think there's this uh, great reporter in Chicago, uh, Peter Baker, who's, who's written some on this and the, the implementation of this particular aspect of it, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, hasn't, hasn't been smooth uh, for, precisely because of some of those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and what Peter Baker talks about is how it's basically become, uh, there's a curriculum, mm -hmm. but you have to be trained to, to, to learn the curriculum. So, and it's, it's on the teachers themselves to learn how, how to be trained. So it's, it's mostly um, teachers working in black and brown communities that wanna learn how to be trained to, to grapple with the curriculum and implement it. So I, I have the sense now that it's being bypassed in, in some of the white communities. Uh, though Peter's uh, reporting uh, looked at uh, white neighborhoods that are implementing it versus black ones and the differences. Um, but I think that's the, that's the story of policing in America. It's a, it's a story of families. It's a story of, you know, the relationship between the military and the policing and the police. And, you know, even in black communities, the, you know, policing and the military is a very important occupation and it's a very important way that people have maintained their their livelihoods for generations and continue to do so. Um, so it's not an easy issue, but I think we have to learn how to see the difference between um, learning about this history and, and then and then seeing that as an attack on oneself. You know, I think Grappling with the history is only healthy if you want to improve, uh, you know, or see some of the flaws within the system that you're you're operating in. Right. I mean, to me, that you know, I just think I always have this, um, especially since the Invisible Institutes data came out. And if you haven't seen this, I encourage you to to look on their website. Invisible Institute is the name of the organization you can actually see the names of officers. So in my own research, there were officers that I would encounter that were, you know, sexually harass women in the prosecutor's office. And I could literally query their name and get all the allegations. And so literally the families then in theory can go say, well, my father is or mother is a cop. I'm going to query to see what kind of cop they are. Right. And they can see it. I mean, now that's the power of this in plain sight. Kind of if we expose it, then we can, you know, I think you use the Martin Luther King's, um, you know, quote to talk about like letting something that, you know, is festering to be exposed. That's an important part. But then what is the dialogue that's happening in these mostly white families that allows them to rationalize that level of abuse that your dad or parents has had 123 allegations of misconduct and many of them for use of force, putting a boot on someone's neck. Some of them are for sexual assaults. These are really serious allegations. So I guess that, that to me is the next, you know, it's like the educational reparations is perfect for communities of color to be able to talk about this, to think, you know, feel that this is not a, a history that's hidden, but really this to me is an important intervention for white communities and their resistance tells us everything about, about that. And what is that narrative that police families then tell about why a parent has that many infractions and what they do every day? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I think this is the time for difficult conversations. It's not like, I mean, we have to figure out why some people are comfortable in our society with 
what we know now is injustice, you know? It's not, you know, I mean, we, we can only come to the conclusion that some people are comfortable with it or want it, want it, you know? And so what is it that they feel like they need to be protected at the expense of other people and other, other communities? So I wanted to kind of, we're, we're almost rounding uh, down the time. Um, I just wanted to talk you to talk a little bit about the charging genocide portion of the book. And in some ways, talk a little bit about placing Chicago within that larger picture. And I think sometimes when I've used, um, talked about torture, talked about violence, um, I've used those analogies before people were really talking about it. And I know, you know, I used to get, you know, a lot of white folks actually rolling their eyes when I would say that, which was enormously offensive. Um, but part of what the difficulty was trying to explain this level of violence to the academy, to academia, to the discipline of sociology or anthropology or political science. So how do we think about Chicago in terms of understanding larger global issues of human rights and even genocide? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is that uh, the, the We Charge Genocide you know, group that I talk about in Chicago comes from an earlier petition to the UN in 1951. And so just by that fact, you know, two groups going to the UN, you know, one in 1951, one in 2014, addressing the very same issues. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself is remarkable. And mm -hmm. you can almost exchange the, the words of each petition with each other and they're still uh, just as resonant. You know, so that says, you know, despite what we like to think about as political progress in the US, how has certain forms of violence and torture and abuse maintained and be, been consistent throughout American history? And uh, I think the important part about Chicago in this story is that when we look at, again, uh, you know, I'm a big uh, a student of Holocaust studies. And, and when we look at something like genocide, you know, there's, there's ways in which, you know, two, two ways that scholars look at it in the literature. One is, you know, look at the Holocaust as the ultimate genocide mm -hmm. that nothing can compare to. And you can't, you know, there, that's the that's the error moment, historical moment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's this other tradition, like following scholars like Hannah Arendt, in which you use it so you can understand how 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 and that multiple genocides will happen, mm -hmm. and that there are on, always ongoing genocides. And it's genocides in the plural. And so we need to look at the complicity within populations and we need to look at the ways in which people normalize genocide mm -hmm. and, and allow it to happen and allow it to fester in society. And so mm -hmm. I'm following that second tradition and seeing you know, what forms of genocide do we accept in the US and you know, Chicago and its tradition of activism has been very important in putting that in the international spotlight. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way in which bringing attention to these particular injustices can, can highlight the ways in which democracy has never really lived up to its name in American society. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important thing to do. Um, there, there's a long tradition of doing that uh, because when we think about, again, concepts like genocide and torture, a lot of times they don't make sense within the U.S. because they're, uh, they're dismissed as brutality or violence. And when we think about torture, 
we're automatically thinking internationally without even knowing it. We're thinking of Guantanamo Bay, we're thinking of Abu Ghraib, we're thinking of certain certain places or Latin America or or Africa or these these other exotic places where torture is a lot allowed to happen, not the US. But when we bring it into the international stage, we can see that the same actions are happening and the same definitions are being met uh, between what's happening in Chicago and what's happening in all these other places that the US loves to decry as you know undemocratic and, and unconstitutional. Right. And I think what's a really important is, you know, even some of the things that you're describing in looking in the history of the Co of the Cook County Jail when they were deciding whether like where to place the jail, which is the largest single site jail in America, the scale of 72 football fields, right? So this enormous jail. It was academics that actually were saying to the city, you know, the, in, the, the, the world is watching us and these conditions are so deplorable. What would they think of America? So there was this kind of sense of what will they think of us if we create this system? And the city kind of went along and didn't listen uh, to the, to those who warned about placing the jail and creating a jail of that scale. And, you know, and I think we don't have that sense where we worry about the world is watching, right? It's like this kind of exceptionalism that we're, that we're this beacon of democracy and hope and certainly human rights wouldn't be in our, our violations wouldn't be in our backyard. And yet we see over and over again from policing to the jail um, that it is. Uh, so, I guess the, the one question I have and the one that I'm thinking a lot about is criminology. It is a field that studies policing. It is a field that works hand in hand with police. Um, it is a field that has hotspot policing. So not only can they, uh, you know, so they can stop and frisk you more efficiently, <laughs> know where you live, know where you go. And yet the discipline itself often does not look at race or racism or racial disparity. I mean, it looks a little bit at it, but it kind of dismisses it as being not relevant to what they do. And so I think one of the things that I'm, if we're reckoning with police violence right now, how do you see a field like criminology or even sociology that has in some ways been complicit with the work of police departments? And I'm having a hard time with it right now because I I think that the money that universities take, the money academics take, we can almost name the people taking that money that in some ways makes police better at the type of violence that you detail in the book. What do we do with academia and its complicity? That's a great question. Oh, uh, I think. Right now they're all tweeting at me. <laughs> Peace out. And we have to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think that we have to assume that when new technologies of, you know, whether technology itself or technologies of knowledge production and scholarship, when it's created in an unjust world, it will be used unjustly, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to kind of safeguard the ways in which we use those um, methods and, and, and forms of scholarship, mm -hmm. uh, but also think intentionally about our collaborations and our partnerships. And, and I think that, you know, I think there's different ways to study power. There's, there's one way to, to, again, we've been talking about exposing um, open secrets and black boxes. And mm -hmm. in that way, it's opening up um, forms of knowledge that are tr that are intentionally trying to bury themselves mm -hmm. and revealing it to the world. Uh, but there's also ways in which one can kind of work with communities that are already doing the work of addressing the problems. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that's what I tried to do in this project, in this book, is to really work with, uh, think through these, these issues of policing with uh, people who are invested in it within the community. I think it's a totally different book if I'm working with the police to think through how they're grappling with this same history. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and that's not to say that it's not a book that should be written. It's just a totally different book that has a different set of priorities and a different set of questions that will be asked. And, and you can see that that kind of book would probably attract a lot of resources and could be used as a way to, to not write the book that I did write. Right. And so I think, you know, one has to think through those issues, especially as scholars and, and think through um, what, what we're trying to accomplish in the production of knowledge. Because, you know, we've been talking about, you know, objectivity and, and taking a stance. And I think that there is no neutral stance right. to take, you know? So it's either you're, you're working to further the status quo or you're working to try to dismantle some of the mechanisms that have created the problems in the first place. And so one has to always think through very carefully uh, what are the ways in which what I'm producing could mm -hmm. potentially further or, or reproduce the problems that I'm trying to address. Absolutely. Well, this has been um, an honor and I just wanna thank you for writing this important book. So there's the book, uh, The Torture Letters. Um, it is you know, a sobering read, but one that treats the subjects and you know, kind of all parties, this kind of this web with such dignity. And um, I am grateful for this book. So thank you very much for writing it. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And so for everybody who tuned in, this is part of our This America series um, from the Center for Slavery and Justice. And we hope that you'll return for other events. And thank you very much, Professor Ralph. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.